Kane is a firm staple piece in WWE history. Initially a silent but violent monster, Kane has experienced huge character development in the almost 20 years that have passed since that fateful night in October 1997. Kane has been able to take a gimmick that could have been one dimensional and made it so much more. The Big Red Machine has been one of the company's scariest characters ever. At different times, he's also been one of its funniest. Kane's gimmick has adapted over time, but so has his role. WWE has asked him to play the predator, the sidekick and the corporate goon. His ability to succeed at each of those stages is one reason he's a bona fide Hall of Famer. Here are the various versions of the devil's favorite demon from worst to best. Number 13, Stalker Kane, 2004 to 2005. After losing his mask and going on something of a violent rampage, Kane moved back down the card following his loss to The Undertaker at WrestleMania 20. This didn't mean an improvement in stories, however, as the Big Red Monster spent the rest of 2004 and a lot of 2005 embroiled in a story with Lita and Matt Hardy. He was now working a new gimmick as a stalker with his eyes set on Lita. At that time, Lita and Matt Hardy were still together and Kane was moving in on her. But then, suddenly, the weird storyline went off the rails. The story was notorious for how distasteful it was at pretty much every turn, as Lita spurned Kane's advances only for the demon to kidnap and impregnate her. Yes, this is the thing that happened. Things got worse as Kane defeated Matt Hardy at SummerSlam, which meant that Lita was contractually obliged to marry Kane. Kane then turned face via Snitsky, causing Lita to miscarry. The Kane-Lita alliance lasted for several months and ended with Lita turning on him to join up with Edge. So to summarize, Kane kidnapped Lita, Kane raped Lita, Lita conceived a baby and then miscarried only to join forces with her rapist. Lita then turned on Kane which made her the bad person. Looking back now it was one of the most offensive storylines in Kane and Lita's resting careers. Kane's acting skills were fairly on point throughout but that isn't enough to forgive the general stink of this era for Kane. Number 12 Resurrected Kane 2011 to 2012. For years after unmasking, fans urged for Kane to put the mask back on and embrace the demonic persona that made him famous in the first place. Beginning in November 2011, WWE began airing vignettes featuring Kane and a burning red mask and ending with the words, Kane resurrected appearing on screen. After a few years of gimmicky storylines that stripped Kane of almost everything that made him successful to begin with, he was back in a new scary mask and ready to terrorize the wrestling world again. When Kane returned, he surprised everyone with a totally new look, with the black predator style visor being a fantastic look that he used just for the entrances. He immediately found himself in a feud with John Cena as the devil's favorite demon valiantly tried to get Super Cena to embrace the hate. The feud absolutely sucked to be honest and it led to two pretty disappointing matches. The 2012 Wrestling Observer Newsletter Award winner for worst feud of the year went to Kane versus John Cena because it was terrible from start to finish. After the Cena feud, Kane moved on to a feud with Randy Orton before a summer world championship program with CM Punk and Daniel Bryan. This period of time might be considered the worst for Kane because there were so much expectations going in due to the return of the mask. After years of Kane coming across as stale in the upper mid card, many thought this would be the gimmick to rejuvenate his career. Unfortunately, it didn't live up to the hype and really and truly the only positive that came out from the resurrected Kane was the birth of Team Hell No. More on that later. Number 11, ECW Champion Kane, 2007 to 2009. By 2007, Kane had reached peak mediocrity. He was, however, still a credible performer with a decent amount of name value to slot into whatever spot was available on the card. That's probably why WWE decided to move Kane to the revamped ECW towards the end of the year. In typical WWE fashion, he found himself in predictable feuds with the likes of Mark Henry and Big Daddy V. Because why not put all the monsters together in a match? WWE logic for you. It's safe to say that they didn't have many classics. Then on the pre-show of WrestleMania 24, Kane won a battle royal to become the number one contender to the ECW Championship, which he won later that night in, at that time, the shortest WrestleMania match in history, ending in just 11 seconds. This reign ended up lasting three months with one successful title defense against Chavo Guerrero before Kane was randomly drafted to Raw. Six days later, Kane ended up losing the title to Mark Henry in a triple threat match with Big Show at Night of Champions. All in all, this was a fairly bland run for Kane. His time on Raw after wasn't any better as he turned heel again as he attacked commentators Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler. Later in 2008, Kane began carrying a mysterious sack while continuously repeating the words, is he alive 
or is he dead? This was eventually revealed to be Rey Mysterio's mask. For some explained reason, Kane had apparently tried to kill the master of the 619. The two had their feud, which also went through a World Heavyweight Championship scramble match at Unforgiven that year, but it was hardly blowing the roof off of arenas. The confusing narrative only made it harder to invest in. To top this period off for Kane, he was then drafted to SmackDown in 2009, which meant that he had basically been a member of all three brands over the span of one year. Clearly, WWE just didn't have a clue of what to do with him. Although, his fortunes would soon change on the blue brand. Continue watching for more on that. Number 10, May 19th Kane, 2005 to 2006. After the terrible Lita fiasco, things didn't get too much better for Kane thereafter. Kane returned to WWE television on the October 17th episode of Raw and soon began a tag team with the Big Show. The two won the tag titles and feuded with Carlito and Masters throughout early 2006, culminating in a successful title defense at WrestleMania 22. Kane and the Big Show lost the World Tag Team Championships to the Spirit Squad the next night and the following week Kane snapped, ostensibly due to voices in his head. He began attacking anyone who mentioned the date, May 19th. WWE went into supernatural overdrive with Kane's voices frequently echoing around arenas. Kane later claimed that this was the day in which his mother and adopted family were killed in a fire. Of course, in reality, May 19th was the day See No Evil was released, the film in which Kane made his silver screen debut as Jacob Goodnight. When Kane was confronted by the source of the voice, an imposter Kane, wearing Kane's old mask and ring attire, chokeslammed the monster during his match against Shelton Benjamin for the Intercontinental Championship. After one month at Vengeance, the imposter defeated the original Big Red Machine. However, fans weren't into the feud. As a result, WWE decided to pull the plug on the feud, and the original Kane managed to overcome the imposter one, tearing the mask away. After that, the imposter Kane was never seen again. Kane was absent from WWE television for two months thereafter, as he toured Europe to promote See No Evil. Wow, clearly 2004 to 2009 was not a great time for Kane. Thankfully, some of his previous and subsequent runs do make up for it. With that being said, we continue on. Number 9, Demon Kane, 2015 to 2021. This brings us to Kane in the current day. Obviously, he is now past his prime and hasn't really been involved in many major storylines over the years. His most notable feuds were to revive the Brothers of Destruction with The Undertaker in order to take down the Wyatt family and reviving T Team Hell No to take on the Bludgeon Brothers. One of his best matches of this era was his triple threat match for the WWE Universal title against Brock Lesnar and Braun Strowman. Although it seems that his spot in the match was largely so that he could take the pin, so Braun would still look strong, which is fair enough. Another great match he was involved in during this period was the TLC tag match against Dean Ambrose, Seth Rollins and a returning Kurt Angle. Everyone really pushed the entertainment factor and with this being Kurt Angle's first match back in the WWE, fans were very excited. Kane looked great in this one, with every wrestler really pushing each other to their limits in what was a main event that delivered. Now he's also had some pretty poor performances too, most notably his showing at Crown Jewel teaming with The Undertaker to take on DX. It has been widely talked about by fans and was one of the worst main event matches in recent years for WWE. Everything that could have gone wrong here did, from Triple H getting injured to Kane's mask falling off partway through the contest. To this day, Kane still makes sporadic appearances now and again, such as the Royal Rumble 2021, but he is now far away away from any stories of importance. He can come out now and then to deliver a choke slam and pop a live crowd, which is all you can ask for considering he's had over 20 years in the business. Number 8, Corporate Kane, 2013 to 2015. Corporate Kane was first a thing at the end of October 2013 when Kane removed the mask for a second time in his career and pledged allegiance to Stephanie McMahon. This saw him become something of a lackey for the authority. Corporate Kane wore a suit and helped run the show to the heel's favour. The run was polarising to fans, but it did help him have a relevant role in the upper card again. Kane feuded with the likes of Roman Reigns, CM Punk and Daniel Bryan during this chapter of his career. Kane did do a great job with what he was given. His dry sense of humour and excellent timing worked well in what was quite clearly a less intense role for the former monster. A lot of people might have hated Corporate Kane, but on the other hand, it allowed Kane to do something he had never done before. He played the serious wrestler and proved that he had a lot more in him than just being a masked monster. He also had one of his greatest matches of his career during this time against Daniel Bryan at Extreme Rules 2014. Both men had incredible chemistry with one another as a duo. However, they also proved they had chemistry facing off with one another. Now that we've got the good stuff out of the way to appear unbiased, I for one thought this version of Kane sucked. For me, it completely destroyed his character and I didn't care for anything he did. It pretty much ruined the gimmick for me. Granted, there were some great moments on television between Rollins and Kane, but overall, he just didn't look strong at all. And what was it with them getting him to wrestle in suit pants. It was god awful and probably limited his ability to 
to wrestle a half decent match. Corporate Kane did have a lot of potential had WWE actually booked him to be an intimidating suit and not a bumbling authority figure who Stephanie constantly verbally castrated. Number 7, Inverted Suit Kane, 1998 to 2000. This was the era where Kane would naively put his trust in someone only for them to take advantage and backstab him. After allying with The Undertaker for two months, Kane was betrayed by his brother for Paul Bearer at Judgment Day in your house. Once his initial story with The Undertaker began to wind down, Kane headed in some rather peculiar directions. The corporation had him committed to an insane asylum and it was the beginning of a year or so of stories that were defined by Kane's need to be loved. In December, after Kane joined the corporation, he aligned himself with China and feuded with Triple H. Then at WrestleMania 15, Kane was betrayed by China China and thrown out of the corporation. Kane then formed a strange team with X Puck, and the weird duo seemed to bring out a more human side in Kane. While teaming with X Puck, Kane evolved from being a mute to aided speech through an electro larynx to speaking unaided. He also became associated with D Generation X. His first unaided words were the DX slogan, Suck It, and the duo won the WWF Tag Team Championships twice. Suck it. This was an important time for the Big Red Monster character-wise. Kane's early character was a seemingly unfeeling monster capable of only rage. He would find more of himself thanks to relationships with tag team partners and his girlfriend Tori. No one could have expected the chemistry between X-Pac and Kane to come their way as a top face tag team. But WWE split them up faster than they should have to reunite D-Generation X with Triple H as a top heel. They could have really teamed for another year based on the fan reaction. X-Pac eventually turned on Kane by sealing his girlfriend friend Tori. Kane and X-Pac then engaged in a lengthy feud against each other. The former partner's feud eventually ended at WrestleMania 2000, where Kane teamed with Rikishi to defeat X-Pac and Rodog. Overall, this was the initial spark to Kane's comedic side coming out, but he hadn't owned in on it fully by this point. Number 6, World Heavyweight Champion Kane, 2009 to 2011. After joining SmackDown in 2009, Kane's fortunes would finally take a turn for the better after being subject to some pretty terrible storylines in the years before. On the June 4, 2010 episode of SmackDown, General Manager Theodore Long announced that The Undertaker was found in a vegetative state by Kane, who vowed to out the identity of The Undertaker's attacker, and for weeks he accused and interrogated other superstars. While this would normally lead to a fairly corny storyline, it actually led to Kane finally climbing to the top of the mountain once again. After winning the SmackDown Money in the Bank ladder match, the Big Red Machine cashed in on Rey Mysterio the same night to become World Heavyweight Champion for the first time in his career. Kane and Mysterio would renew their poor feud from 2008, where weirdly enough, the backstory was yet again centered around attempted murder. This time, Kane had tried to murder his brother The Undertaker and framed Mysterio for it. This was, however, mainly a side story in order to pass the time until the dead man rose again to feud with Kane. Kane followed this up by defeating a returning Undertaker three times in a row, which is pretty astonishing by anyone's standards. His feud with Undertaker was impressive because it finally led to Kane being booked credibly. He was made to look dominant and best of all, he ran with the ball. His promos were excellent and his matches were a lot better than many of us expected. The Night of Champions match was fun, especially with the return of Paul Bearer and then his double cross on The Undertaker. The Buried Alive match was somewhat lacklustre, but the feud ended with Kane looking more dominant than ever. But what really ruined this period for Kane was his feud with Edge. The Radar Superstar kidnapped Paul Bearer and started to play mind games with Kane, trying to psychologically wear him down. They could have gone for a bit more realism. Instead, they threw logic out the window and had Edge be smart enough to constantly trick Kane. Kane went from unstoppable demonic force to some dude who chases slowly after a guy pushing around dummies. Edge eventually won the title from Kane and thus ended their feud on an episode of Smackdown in a last man standing match. Although this was Kane's most successful world title run, his career isn't defined by titles as much as other wrestlers. He will be more remembered for the enduring nature of his character and all of its mutations, which is why this period for him isn't in the top five on the list despite of what he achieved during this time. Number five, half mass Kane, 2002 to 2003. 2002 should have been a good year by all accounts for Kane. After a great run in 2001 helping team WWF against the Alliance, he was allowed to have more of his comedic side come out. Now there were moments here that seemed nothing like the Kane that terrorised fans for years. Following a great match with Kurt Angle at WrestleMania 18, Kane teamed up with Hulk Hogan and The Rock in a match against the NWO. Before the match, as the three were together backstage, things got interesting when Kane started throwing out catchphrases of these two icons. The Big Red Machine delivered their lines beautifully, 
calling his fans Canaanites. He followed it up with a Hogan-esque pose and the WWE Universe went ballistic seeing this and to date reminisces it as one of Kane's funniest moments. You ready? You bet your ass I'm ready. It doesn't matter if you're ready. <laughs> 20,000 screaming Canaanites. Canaanites? What you gonna do? In August 2002, Kane debuted a new attire with a revised mask. Kane partnered with Booker T and Goldust to square off against the Un-Americans. As the Big Red Machine's team emerged victorious, Booker T did his special move, the Spinner Rooney, only for Kane to do one of his own, the Kane Rooney. His acrobats doing this move induced a phenomenal cheer from the WWE Universe. They came here to see the Kane Rooney. Kane Rooney! The Red Machine can do it. Later in September, Kane picked up the World Tag Team Championships with the Hurricane. There was a startling contrast between a comedy character like Helms and Kane's monstrous persona. This worked to create a number of funny moments. During that time, he would also go on to become the Intercontinental Champion for a brief period before dropping the belt to Triple H after the terrible Katie Vick angle. The storyline became controversial when a tape was displayed of a mannequin in a casket being seduced by Triple H who was wearing a Kane mask. The necrophilia angle soon made the storyline very disturbing to fans. It ended up becoming one of the worst storylines WWE has ever had. The K.E. Vic angle did not favour Kane's character despite being one of the most known stunts in wrestling history since he made his debut in 1997. Months later, Kane formed a tag team with Rob Van Dam where they found success in early 2003 when WWE needed new acts for the brand split. Two fan favourites working together gave the audience a top duo to cheer for in the tag division. His partnership with Rob Van Dam had him goofing around backstage. WWE lightened up his character and he thrived in segments which featured not so veiled references to getting high. I looked at my watch afterwards, it said 420. I found this stinky skunk and I took it down into my basement. Dude, you came across that skunk too? That was incredible, right? RVD showed a new side of Kane and vice versa to help them both when struggling to find relevance after losing their respective title shots in the singles division. Overall, Kane had a nice run here that contributed but didn't really define his career. Number four, Team Hell No Kane. 2012 to 2013. After the initial disappointment of resurrected Kane, the career of the Big Red Machine was somewhat reinvigorated by the establishment of the oddest of odd couples. Kane completely reinvented his career when teaming with Daniel Bryan to form Team Hell No. The storyline started with them as rivals, forced to attend anger management classes together. Both wrestlers were hilarious and showed chemistry that sparked the team starting. Chemistry is impossible to force in professional wrestling and the weird duo of Kane and Daniel Bryan had it in spades. Kane and Bryan went through trust exercises together and hugged it out under Dr. Shelby's supervision. Whenever a WWE superstar ends up going down the comedy route, it's a sign that things could be doomed. In Kane's case, that was never in doubt as he managed to keep the core of his character intact while embracing that comedic side. For example, Team Hell No alongside Daniel Bryan brought out a whole new side of Kane who, despite going down the comedy route, didn't do any damage to his persona. Throughout the anger management classes, Kane remained the character that terrified the life out of everyone by recounting his long and disturbed history from kidnapping to arson. It was all still there to show that WWE didn't completely strip away the Kane character. The duo were quickly transitioned into the tag team competition and dubbed Team Hell No, picking up the tag team gold in no time. Team Hell No became the most popular team in WWE and a highlight of the shows every week. It was a special time in the careers of both wrestlers. Team Hell No might be the most entertaining tag team in WWE from the last decade, as Bryan and Kane were perfectly matched. Over the course of the next year or so, Kane and Bryan went from bickering foes to the closest of friends. And while their friendship couldn't survive Bryan's beef with the authority, it certainly did refresh Kane somewhat in the eyes of the audience. It was an amplified version of what fans saw with Kane teaming with Helms and Van Damme. It was refreshing, especially coming from a man who had spent so much of his career trying to burn people alive. Number three, Unmasked Kane. 2003 to 2004. In 2003, after being embroiled in a truly terrible feud with Triple H, Kane was forced to unmask after coming up short against the cerebral assassin on an episode of WWE Raw that summer. This was a huge deal at the time, and whilst the prevailing feeling would be that more could have been done with it, what we got was still pretty damn exciting. 
That image of Kane removing his mask is still imprinted in the minds of many fans. Kane went on an utter rampage, becoming the unstable monster he was initially for the first time in years. One commenter on YouTube summed it up brilliantly. When the mask was on, Kane was thought to be a monster that was molded by the flames that disfigured him. When the mask came off, it turned out the scars were just in his mind and he wasn't a monster, but a violent psychopath hiding in a mask. The mask held his insecurities and overall, it mentally and emotionally kept him under control. When the mask came off, Kane was more insecure than ever and that made him more violent and dangerous than ever before. That's some damn good storytelling for you. Kane became more of a psychologically disturbing foe, both through his actions and his words. He was Frankenstein's monster in his original incarnation and now someone far more in control of their vile actions, a tormentor, a sadist. He set poor old JR on fire, electrocuted Shane McMahon's testicles, tombstone Linda McMahon on the stage, and help Vince McMahon bury The Undertaker. All in all, it was an eventful few months for Kane. He became a violently unstable monster again, and whilst most of the work was thrown away within a year, it still provided us with some of our favorite memories of the big red monster. If you really want a taste of how evil he became, go back and watch the Survivor Series 2003 Ambulance Match video package. It truly highlights why this version of Kane was so horrifying. Also, have a watch of his entrance for his August 11, 2003 match with Eric Bischoff on Raw. Kane, with the towel over his head, being led out by the security in shackles and coming out to slow chemical was just perfect. Filthy monster. Overall, fused with Rob Van Dam, Shane McMahon and The Undertaker made the run a success. Number 2, Singlet Vest Kane, 2000 to 2001. The late 2000 heel turn of Kane made him one of the top heels in the company again. Ditching the bodysuit for a singlet only enhanced his monster look as he would go on to feud with the likes of The Undertaker, The Rock and Chris Jericho. His SummerSlam 2000 match with The Undertaker ended when the Deadman removed his brother's mask, causing him to flee the ring, covering his exposed face. Shortly after, Kane stayed in contention for the WWF Championship for the remainder of the year and ended 2000 in a feud with Chris Jericho. Chris Jericho and Kane had great matches that helped fans remember that Kane was a top tier star even with the stacked roster. When Vince McMahon purchased WCW in 2001, Kane's career was at something approaching a crossroads. He'd come in like a house on fire before cooling off somewhat with a number of humanizing feuds and flirting dangerously with becoming obsolete. 2001 became the year in which Kane truly proved his value to the WWE. He began the year by eliminating a then record 11 men from the Royal Rumble, finishing as runner up to none other than Stone Cold Steve Austin. The Big Red Machine followed this up by defeating Raven and Big Show at WrestleMania 17 to win the hardcore championship. Kane became a more credible competitor who could fill any spot at any time, be it monstrous heel or loyal babyface. The demon was also still fresh enough to be exciting at this point, and this combined with his fast improving in ring work made for a fantastic year. WWE started utilizing The Undertaker and Kane together as a tag team in 1998, before making them a full-time duo in 2001. Kane and Undertaker got over huge as a tag team during the Invasion era, completely dominating against every other duo. They became the tag team champions on two occasions, and Kane also captured his first intercontinental title during this period. 2000 to 2001 Kane was in peak physical conditioning. He was having some of the best matches of his career against the likes of Chris Jericho at Armageddon 2000 and Triple H at Judgment Day 2001. He was involved in the fantastic triple threat hardcore match at WrestleMania 17 and surprising to many, he has some classic TV matches against Albert on SmackDown. I would definitely recommend you go and check those out. You'll even see Kane hitting an impressive Hurricane Rana in one of the matches. The gimmick was already there, but he started doing some incredible stuff in the ring that made him a must-watch attraction. Look at that power. Look at that power. Oh, Kane. <laughs> Number 1, Original Kane. 1997 to 1998. Everyone's major memory of Kane has to be that debut, right? After being teased for months, Kane finally arrived at Bad Blood 1997, interfering in the first ever Hell in a Cell match. The world found out exactly who Kane was, as the big red monster marched down to the ring, ball bearer by his side, with the giant wrestler looking like something straight out of a horror movie. Who can forget that walk down to the ring with Vince shouting, that's gotta be Kane. <laughs> Kane. 
He went on to rip off the cell door, which was shocking to fans at the time, and squared up to The Undertaker, delivering a vicious tombstone in one of WWE's most iconic moments. WWE played up his size, let Paul Bearer do the talking for him, and had him dominate everyone in his way. The original character of Kane was the best, when looking back at the success it created in a fast time, Kane debuting to cost The Undertaker the first Hell in a Cell match against Shawn Michaels instantly made him a star. The supernatural powers of Kane haunted Undertaker and tormented many others on the roster over the first few months. Kane even won the WWE Championship from Steve Austin during this chapter of his career, and it didn't feel wrong. This version of Kane clearly set the table for his entire career in WWE. The thrill wouldn't truly last past Kane's feud with Taker and his alliance with Mankind, but the memory still lasts to this day. His unmasking may have been more violent, his relationship with Daniel Bryan more entertaining, and his 2001 era more valuable, but nothing can truly top his debut. Kane didn't talk, he just destroyed people. Paul Bearer was his manager and mouthpiece, and Kane was very scary and a brilliant professional wrestling creation. He spent the next 20 odd years living off this wrestling character. And that brings us to the end of this video. As always, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. And also let me know your thoughts in the comments of which version of Kane you preferred the best. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.